Hello and welcome to our worship service at Epiphany of Christ Lutheran Church at Apache Junction, Arizona. I'm Pastor Steve Crittenden and so glad that you have joined us on this 13th Sunday after Pentecost. Way at the beginning of summer, at the beginning of Pentecost, I talked to you about how the church was entering this long green season of uh, Sundays after Pentecost. And this was a time when Jesus would be teaching his disciples and teaching us and primarily teaching two things. First, Jesus was teaching that he is the Messiah and what it means that he's the Messiah. And the second thing he's teaching is uh, what it is like in the kingdom of God, or as Matthew calls it, the kingdom of heaven. And so we'll be learning more about that in our worship service today as Jesus is teaching his disciples and us. As always, you can head to epiphanyofchristlutheran.org. You'll find our worship bulletin there. It's uh, posted as a PDF. You can print it or have it on another screen. And uh, particularly you who uh, are good singers and musicians, you'll have access then to the music of the hymns that we're singing. But now, friends, let's begin our worship with confession and forgiveness. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, who forgives all our sin, whose mercy endures forever. Seeking reconciliation with God and neighbor, let us confess our sin. God of mercy, we confess that we have sinned against you, against one another, and against the earth entrusted to our care. We are worried and distracted by many things, and we fail to love you above all else. We store up treasures for ourselves and turn away from our neighbors in need. Forgive us that we may live in the freedom of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. When we were laid low by sin, God made us alive together with Christ, forgiving all of our trespasses by taking our sins to the cross. Christ has set you free. Rejoice in the good news. The first reading today comes from Ezekiel, chapter 33. So you, mortal, I have made a sentinel for the house of Israel. Whenever you hear a word from my mouth, you shall say, give them warning from me. If I say to the wicked, O oh, wicked ones, you shall surely die. And you do not speak to warn the wicked to turn from their ways. The wicked shall die in their iniquity but their blood I will require at your hand. But if you warn the wicked to turn from their ways, and they do not turn from their ways, the wicked shall die in their iniquity, but you will have saved your life. 
Now you, mortal, say to the house of Israel, Thus you have said, Our transgressions and our sins weigh upon us, and we waste away because of them. How then can we live? Say to them, As I live, says the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from their ways and live. Turn back, turn back from your evil ways, for why will you die, O house of Israel? Word of God, word of life. The psalm reading today comes from Psalm 119, verses 33 through 40. Teach me, O Lord, the ways of your statutes, and I shall keep it to the end. Give me understanding, and I shall keep your teaching. I shall keep it with all my heart. Lead me in the path of your commandments, for that is my desire. Incline my heart to your decrees, and not to unjust gain. Turn my eyes from beholding falsehoods. Give me life in your way. Fulfill your promise to your servant, which is for those who fear you. Turn away the reproach that I dread, because your judgments are good. Behold, I long for your commandments. By your righteousness, enliven me. The second reading comes from the book of Romans, chapter 13. Owe no one anything except to love one another. For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandment, are summed up in this word, love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. Besides this, you know what time it is, how it is now the moment for you to wake from sleep. For salvation is nearer to us now than when we became believers. The night is far gone, the day is near. Let us then lay aside the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us live honorably as in the day, not in reveling and drunkenness, not in debauchery and licentiousness, not in quarreling and jealousy. Instead, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh, flesh to gratify its desires. Word of God, word of life. And hear now the Holy Gospel, according to Matthew, the 18th chapter. Jesus said to the disciples, If another member of the church sins against you, go and point out the fault when the two of you are alone. If the member listens to you, you have regained that one. But if you are not listened to, take one or two others along with you, so that every word may be confirmed by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If the member refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if the offender refuses to listen even to the church, let such a one be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly, I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, truly, I tell you, if two of you agree on earth about anything you ask, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there among them. The Gospel of the Lord. Now, when I was a kid, I was taught 
to obey rules by my parents. I was taught to obey rules, obey signs. I imagine that you were taught the same thing by your parents. And one of the places that this would happen would be at the dinner table. As the family would gather for dinner, one of the things that we would have is life lessons. We would talk about things, talk about why it's important to follow rules and obey signs. It's good for us to do that, and it's good for the people around us to do that. But I would always push the matter. I would always come up with these crazy hypothetical situations uh, that tried to push what the rule is. So, for example, I'd say, now, Dad... What if I come to a do not walk sign, but I'm being chased by a bear? Is it okay for me then to go into the crosswalk? What if I'm at the park and I see that a tree is about to fall on a baby stroller, but there's a sign that says stay off the grass? Can I get on the grass in order to save that baby that's in that stroller. Maybe there's twins in there. I remember when I was 12 years old, had the conversation once at the dinner table. I said, Dad, would it be okay if if I had to take Mom to the hospital, could I drive the car? And Dad said, well, you wouldn't need to just call an ambulance. That was before there was 911. You have to look it up. Maybe there was a sticker on your phone. Uh, You'd have to call an ambulance. And I said, but dad, the reason mom has to go to the hospital is that the telephone pole fell over on her. Can I drive the car in those? Well, I would come up with these absolutely mind-boggling hypothetical situations, situations that would never, ever, ever happen in a million years. Well, friends, we have our gospel reading today, and Jesus is lifting up a situation that is not at all hypothetical. Jesus says, if another member of the church sins against you, that's not very far-fetched. It's easy for us to imagine that that's happening. Now, we have to remember here that when Jesus is talking about the church, this is only one of two times in Matthew's gospel that Jesus uses the word church. As he's talking about the church, he's not talking about the church as an institution. That wouldn't come for a few hundred more years. Uh, Jesus isn't talking here about Epiphany of Christ Lutheran Church or some other church as an institution. Jesus is talking here about the community of the baptized. And the reality is that conflict has always been a part of the church. Remember the story of Thomas. Thomas, remember, uh, came uh, from whatever he was doing. He came in, and uh, there were the other disciples, and the disciples said to him, Thomas, we have seen the Lord. And Thomas's response is, I don't believe you. That's conflict. Thomas says, I'm not going to believe you. I'm not going to believe it unless I see it myself. There was conflict in the early church in Jerusalem also when Peter was refusing to baptize anybody that hadn't been circumcised. There were conflicts that arose about what writings were authoritative and sacred. There were arguments about the nature of the Trinity. There was a little dust-up, you might recall, called the Reformation. There were conflicts over whether or not we should say sins or debts or trespasses in the Lord's Prayer. Should we have seats or pews in the sanctuary? Should we use juice or wine with communion? And then the biggest controversy of all in the church. You're sitting in my seat. Friends, it's not hypothetical for Jesus to suggest that there would be conflicts. But conflicts in the church, again, doesn't just mean in the institutional church. And I imagine that Matthew included this teaching of Jesus because there was conflict in Matthew's community at the time. And so Jesus offers up for us in this reading a step-by-step process. 
And how wonderful is that? Because we love step-by-step processes. That's why we buy brownie mixes. Brownie mixes have everything packaged in there that we need, but you turn the box over and it's a step-by-step process of how to make brownies. What a beautiful thing that is. We love step-by-step processes so much that we put them on shampoo bottles. Lather, rinse, repeat. In the history of people, has anybody ever squirted a bunch of shampoo in their hand and then said, well, now I wonder what to do? That lather, rinse, and repeat isn't on the shampoo bottle because we can't figure it out. It's on there because we love step-by-step processes. And Jesus gives us one here. Step one is that you go to the offender When the two of you are alone, step two, if that doesn't work, then take two or three of your friends with you. If that doesn't work, then step three is that you take the entire community with you, the whole church with you. And then step four, if that doesn't work, then you treat that person as a Gentile or a tax collector. This process is so important that it's a part of our Constitution At Epiphany of Christ Lutheran Church, it's part of the Constitution, uh, the ELCA model Constitution. But sisters and brothers, this is a process that cannot work. It doesn't work. Oh, it could work, but we mess it up. We do it wrong. And again, it's really important here to remember that we're not talking... Jesus, when Jesus is lifting up the church, he's not talking about the church as, a, as, a, as an institution. He's not talking about the congregation that uh, meets at Epiphany of Christ Lutheran Church. He is talking about the community of the baptized. He's talking about virtually everybody you will ever come into contact. He's talking about your neighbor. He's talking about the stranger at the grocery store. He's talking about the politicians and the people who support them. He's talking about the people who carry Black Lives Matter signs and support the police signs. Friends, this process doesn't work because our failure in this process is always that we don't start at the first step. We start at the second step. It would be sort of like uh, if we're shampooing, I'm going to begin by rinsing, and then I'm going to lather up, and then I'll towel off and get dressed and go on with my day. The process doesn't work because what we always do is start with step two, which is to complain to other people about what somebody has done. And then we think that somehow we can reset the process. That we can reset and start back at step one, but that never ever works because the process that Jesus gives is step by step and we can't mess with that. When I've seen this happen, when I've seen this being put in force uh, and in use formally in the institutional church, And when I have talked with colleagues that have done it, it doesn't work. It doesn't work because because we always pretend that we can reset the process, even though we've already violated the process. So therefore, instead of looking at what Jesus is teaching here as a step-by-step process, even though we love step-by-step processes, let's instead... Look for what Jesus is lifting up in this teaching. And the very first thing we will see is that Jesus is lifting up reconciliation. Jesus is lifting up the maintenance and the restoration of relationship. And Jesus is cautioning, don't be so quick to cast somebody aside. Don't be so quick to be willing to cut off your relationship with another member of the church, with another member of your community of the baptized. Along with reconciliation, Jesus is lifting up here the power of conversation. 
particularly, and if you look in here, particularly look at how many times we hear the verb to listen being used. It's important for us to listen, but it's not just listening, it's doing good listening. In, uh, in the mornings, as I'm flipping around on news channels, I will occasionally go to a cable news channel whose views of the world are very, very different than mine. I'm not afraid of being exposed to what they have to say, and, and I kind of uh, turn over there to try to try to get a better glimpse of why it is that they look at the world the way they do, but, but invariably what ends up happening is that I hear something and, and then I head over to the social networks and I say, you'll never believe what I just heard them say. Because you see, even though I, I went over there to ostensibly listen to them, what I was really doing was listening for the sake of correcting them. And I wasn't listening to understand them. Jesus is lifting up conversation here and particularly lifting up listening. But we need to listen for the sake of understanding the other person, not for the sake of correcting the other person. And what Jesus lifts up here, along with reconciliation and communication, Jesus lifts up again this repeated call of binding and loosing. Jesus is saying, loose yourself from the grip of the world and bind yourself to heavenly things. Jesus is suggesting here that it's more important to end an argument than it is to win an argument. And what that requires is humility. It requires humility to seek reconciliation. It requires humility to listen from the position of trying to understand somebody. And it requires humility to understand God's call that we maintain relationship with one another. In verse 20, Jesus Jesus makes a promise to us. Jesus makes a promise that in the midst of our ugliness, Jesus will be there. Jesus is telling us that our God, who is so unfathomably holy, chooses to dwell in unholy places because the people our God loves are in those unholy places places. And there is nothing that can separate us from God's love. But the most important thing of all that Jesus lifts up here, the most important thing is what we see in step four. Um, step four says if the person doesn't listen, then treat that person as a Gentile, as a tax collector. If we hear that with worldly ears, then we hear that from the perspective of winning and losing. And if that person won't listen to us, then they're out of here. They're out of here and we cast them off. But if we hear step four with gospel ears, then we remember that Matthew himself was a tax collector. That he was not cast aside. Because God doesn't do that. And neither should we. The gospel tells us, in fact, that Jesus spent extra time with Gentiles and tax collectors and sinners. And step four tells us that we should put in that extra effort also. Because like them, our relationship with God is not our doing, but God's doing. Next week's Gospel uh, reading is going to continue this teaching from the 18th chapter of Matthew. And while there are some very serious and dramatic offenders 
who people should be separated from. For the most part, that isn't the case. For the most part, it is better to stay in relationship with people. It is better to keep trying. But it can get hard. It can get very hard, especially when we recognize that we are trying harder than the other person is trying. But when it gets hard, we're invited to pray in the name of our Lord, who promises to be there among us. Amen. Drawn together in the compassion of God, we pray now for the church, the world, and all those in need. Unite your church, O God. Grant us the gifts of repentance and reconciliation. Bless the cooperative work of churches in this community. Strengthen ecumenical partnerships. Guide the work of the Lutheran World Federation and the World Council of Churches. Lord, in your mercy. Protect your creation, O God. Teach us ways that do not harm what you have entrusted to our care. Renew and enliven places suffering from drought, flood, storms, or pollution. Lord, in your mercy. Turn nations and leaders from ways that lead to death. Shape new paths toward peace and cooperation teaching us to recognize one another as neighbors, guide legislators, civil servants, justice, uh, judges, and police toward laws that protect the well-being of all. Lord, in your mercy, tend to all in need of your compassion. Hear the cries of those awaiting justice and those yearning for forgiveness. Give community to the lonely and neighbors to the outcast. Shelter all who are vulnerable in body, mind, or spirit. Lord, in your mercy. Sustain us in our work, O God, and give work to those who need it. Shape societies to ensure fair treatment of all who labor. Help us to love our neighbors in and through our work. Lord, in your mercy. 
We remember with thanksgiving those who have died in faith. As you equip them, equip us with your protection and power until with them we see your salvation, Lord, in your mercy. All these things and whatever else you see that we need, we entrust to your mercy through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We continue to do the ministry of the church and the ministries of Epiphany of Christ Lutheran Church thanks to the continued generosity of your gifts. And so we offer up this offering prayer. Blessed are you, O God, maker of all things. You have set before us many blessings. Send us forth to be blessings in the midst of a suffering world through Jesus Christ who teaches us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And now, Mothering God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you and lead you into the way of truth and life. Amen. Go in peace. Christ is with you.